we certainly know of a number of incidents where the threats have reached a level where they felt it better to cancel the program or, or to close the library. We're working very hard so that librarians and library workers feel safe in doing their jobs and doing it according to their commitment to the ethical precepts of freedom of access to information, their support for the First Amendment. Welcome and thank you for coming, you know. Not a problem. I'm happy to be here. I would love to just ask you a question to get us going. What is the purpose of a library? A library is a community institution in most instances. I, I should preface, there's all kinds of libraries, but in the United States here, we have public libraries. And the purpose of that community institution is to make a range of ideas, resources, viewpoints available to the public for their enrichment, for their learning, for ability to explore issues, make up their own minds, to become effective participants in a, a democratic society, getting the information they need to be gainfully employed, to engage in self-improvement, entertainment, uh, to be voters who are able to participate in government and contribute to civic enterprises in their community. It does so much. It also is a place for literacy, early reading, early learning, to support young people's education, to make resources available that might not be available in the schools that are available to them, to support and prepare them for college um, uh, or careers or uh, entering the military as adults, and to really uh, provide opportunities for exploring a broader world, developing critical thinking skills, gaining empathy for others that they live with in the community. Now, in some ways, the, the town library, the small town library, bringing knowledge to every single corner of the United States, this was seen since, you know, as a crowning achievement, you know, at a certain period of time, yeah? Absolutely. And, you know, there's some elements of the idea that everyone with access to a library could bootstrap the, their lives into productive career and life and everything. And, you know, making information universally available so that everyone comes from a level playing field. You know, as we all know, that hasn't quite played out in practice. There are many communities that are underserved. Uh, we do have a sad history of libraries not being available to marginalized communities, uh, the uh, history of segregated libraries in the South, for example, or the lack of library access altogether for Black Americans in the South under Jim Crow. Um, but overall, the ideal is to ensure that everyone has the resources available to them, information resources available to them, to learn, to improve, to engage with society, and to make that universally available to them. Now, we've had periods in our history where certain books have been banned or controversial over time, but have we ever seen the, for lack of a better description, the level of culture war that we have going on right this minute? Is this a new phenomenon or an old phenomenon? I'd say that we've always had some level of censorship in our libraries throughout history. Certainly, we can look back to the Comstock era, which was more uh, even society-wide, you know, preventing the importation of certain salacious literature. But I think that what I've observed is over the last 20 to 30 years, the debate hasn't been about books that are generally available to adults, written by adults for an adult audience. I think the debate is what's available to young people. And I think that that's always been uh, a topic that's waxed or waned. We can look back to the 1990s when there was a moral panic over secular humanism being taught in schools or, or evolution, you know. And 
throughout the years, I've seen books like Harry Potter be most frequently banned in schools and libraries for a number of years, and then that wanes, um, and new disputed issues rise to the surface. Uh, and most recently, it's been books that address the lives and experiences of LGBTQIA persons and the lives and experiences of Black Americans, particularly those books that question the accepted orthodoxy around slavery and the experience of racism in the United States that lift the voices of Black Americans themselves about their experience with racism in the United States. And I think the pushback we're seeing is an effort to impose a certain orthodoxy that represents an old way of thinking that silences the voices of those who finally found a place in the public stage, who secured their civil liberties, and an attempt to try to turn the clock back by controlling information for young people. And uh, I think a truly mistaken belief that if they hide the books, they won't be gay, or that they'll accept a certain way of thinking about race and racism in the United States. I think we've all seen that, that approach doesn't work well. But in the meantime, it means that children and young adults throughout the United States are being denied access to information to a level of education that they certainly should be enjoying in the United States. Who's doing the banning? I just want to, so for the audience to understand, you know, is it this, the, the local municipality? When, when something gets banned, who's authorizing that within a, let's say to Jesse's idea, a small library? Yeah, so I will step back to say that, uh, as Jesse's recognized, libraries and schools are local community institutions, and they're generally governed or controlled by either boards of trustees who are elected locally or appointed by local elected officials. And so, you know, the old aphorism is that all library politics are local, all school politics are local. And so in our view when a board or an elected official or an administrator at the direction of a board removes a book from the shelf of a library and prevents the community, whether that's a community of students or a community as a whole, from reading that book and stigmatizing the ideas in that book, that's when a ban occurs. That should be distinguished from advocacy groups like Moms for Liberty, No Left Turn in Education, who are approaching these boards with demands to remove these books from the shelves of school libraries and public libraries in a campaign to limit access to what they believe is either morally or politically appropriate, which we should all find objectionable on any terms in a democracy like ours. So we have, you know, you can look at it in two ways. Who does the banning? Well, ultimately it's a decision of the government entity that runs the public library or the school library, but also there is a real effort, an advocacy campaign by a number of organizations to encourage elected officials to take the step. And of course, there's all kinds of censorship that's not official censorship or censorship imposed by governments. And some of it is actually, you know, the individual ability to exercise choices about one's reading or if you're a bookseller, what books that you'll put on the shelf for sale, or a publisher's decision about what news stories to publish, or a magazine publisher's decision about stories. Some might call it censorship, but it's a liberty that everyone still enjoys. But we focus very tightly on efforts by government entities to limit access to information based on our support for the First Amendment's promises of the freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom and the freedom to read and make choices and choose one's own beliefs that are inherent to the First Amendment and that the First Amendment in theory bars any government from making so. You know, a, um, a person who chooses to be a librarian in a small town generally I would imagine comes from the small town. You know, they believe in critical thinking because why else would you be a librarian if you didn't? You know, through periods of time, there's been controversy about books. There's been controversy about a piece of literature, of you know, an idea, something, you know, like that. Has there been a time that has been so dangerous to be a librarian as there is now? Well, certainly in this moment where we're seeing such 
efforts to divide us, to advance authoritarian methods of governance, we're seeing librarians, uh, library workers come under attack for simply doing their jobs. And we're working very hard to try to ensure that the civic conversation around this issue remains at a level so that librarians and library workers feel safe in doing their jobs and doing it according to their commitment to the ethical precepts of freedom of access to information, their support for the First Amendment, and working very hard with authorities to address those situations where that hasn't been true. And we have seen not everywhere um, and not in every town, but we certainly know of a number of incidents where the threats have reached a level where it, they felt it better to cancel the program or, or to close the library. Um, and some, sadly, some librarians who, you know, if you think about librarianship as a profession dedicated to serving a community's interests, um, there have been a number of librarians who felt that they had to leave their employment and go elsewhere. And, you know, some of this needs to be addressed by the communities themselves. Well, it, it probably, it probably all has to be addressed by the communities themselves Absolutely. because there's no other way to you know, make yeah, the change, but how does it, how does it diminish a community when one of these lights goes out, when a person leaves, who's a dedicated person, you know, giving of their time, their life force to do nothing but make available these options for people? What does it do to a community to lose that? It can be devastating. You know, when we tell the library story, it's not just about access to books. It's about access to broadband and the ability to use online platforms for job applications, for remote learning, um, support for homeschooling families, access to the kind of online learning that helps people change careers or improve their um, job prospects. Access or their to medical knowledge, you know, to understand medical their medical conditions. Health. Yeah, telehealth, tax information, government information. It's the libraries that are making access available so people can apply for FEMA benefits after the hurricane. And so when you no longer have a library, when the library closes because the librarian withdraws, you're losing access to all that important supports and resources for the community. It, you know, small businesses no longer have the ability to look up the information they need. The entrepreneurs lose access to information. We shouldn't want that. Libraries do all of that and more. You know, support for um, reading and early literacy among young people. You know, when you think about all that a library does and achieves and what librarians do, you just marvel that individuals would make it difficult for them to do their jobs or to threaten them for simply doing their jobs, which is what we're seeing in a number of instances. But we are also seeing heartening pushback. You know, individuals show up to rally, to protect and support their librarians and to speak out at board meetings, to push back against this authoritarian impulse to control access to information. And we frankly have started to work on resources for individuals in communities, community groups to use to support their libraries, to support their librarians, and to push back on the impulse to censor access to information. One of them is this campaign called Unite Against Book Bans at uniteagainstbookbans.org. And there's a wealth of resources there for individuals and community groups to use to both push back against censorship and to support their local libraries. So Deborah, it's like the it, fundamental problem that we have, which is, it seems like it's always a smaller group of people that have access to some kind of power or they have the bigger microphone that are fearful and you know are, are worried that if you read a book, you might sort of be more inclined to go one direction or another. How do you combat that? Like, how do we think about the groups of people? Are they multiplying? Are they across all, you know, all of our cities and small towns? Is this a growing phenomena or is it, is it you know, where are we on the trend of this? Because it's unbelievably dangerous as you've articulated. I can report on what we're observing and we're seeing groups like Moms for Liberty. They, have, are, they seem incredibly well-funded and well-organized for groups that didn't exist even three years ago to the point where they're having national conventions. They're being courted by elected officials. 
Uh, and so we're seeing this multiply across the country. And that's not always, you know, sometimes it's Moms for Liberty, sometimes it's parents defending education, self-styled parents' rights groups. But we're actually seeing groups that have been classified as hate groups engage and attack the local library. Uh, there's a group called Mass Resistance that has an anti-LGBTQ agenda that has actively engaged to attack and control public libraries in a number of communities across the country. And some of this may be tied to, um, I can only speculate, you know, I think that we're in a time where individuals are encouraged to think of their selves as the most important thing, their beliefs as the most important thing, their own rights as the most important thing, a real loss of tolerance and community spirit, uh, the idea that we share resources, that we all pitch in together to support everyone's flourishing, whatever that means for the individual. And that's being played out with this, these groups that are adopting these very authoritarian and restrictive agendas in the service of preserving a status quo that probably hasn't existed for decades, but they're making the real effort. And so all we can do is talk to one another, I think, create the opportunity to share one's lives and experiences. When you're silencing the voices of those who have not traditionally had a voice in society, it's impossible to understand their lives, to understand their experiences, to gain the empathy that would lead to that tolerance and, and that sharing of resources in the community. And I think that that's part of it here. You know, certainly, as you say, it's a matter of power and control as well. I think it's incumbent on those of us who find that important to find our own voices and, you know, as however uncomfortable it might be to take our place on the public stage and push back. You know, someone said, what can I do? And I said, well, you know, make sure you're registered to vote. Make sure you know who you're electing. Because there's been a number of instances where individuals have run for school boards and library boards. And once they're elected, they implement a censorship agenda, limitation based on their prejudices and political proclivities. So I say, understand that. Or better yet, run for office yourself, you know, with a commitment to look after the community that you're representing and making sure that everyone's needs are met, that everyone is served equally and as a whole. And it might be a time when we can't all be comfortable uh, in our lives, but engaging publicly with our neighbors and talking with them and reaching out. Uh, you know, it's, I can argue about legal solutions. I can argue about political solutions and things like that. But ultimately, it's developing a culture of sharing and neighborliness that I think we kind of set aside in the debate of whose politics are most important in the last few years. And we can't offer a complete solution, but we can argue for the need for libraries, not only for access to certain books, as I said, but to all kinds of resources that help the community as a whole flourish and to defend the idea that everyone should be able to find the books and information they want and need in the community institution that's designed to do that. You know, we've always thought of America as a, you know, shiny beacon on a hill. But mm -hmm. if you look around right at this moment in time, it doesn't look that different from Hungary or or from Brazil or, you know, Russia, you know, what, what keeps America being America? You know, we've gone through these challenging periods before, but, but what do you see as unique to, to being American, if anything? You know, I, you know, it's always been in my mind that what makes America unique is the fact that we protect those without power, that we protect our minorities, and that's what we're losing right now. And that the rule of law is there to ensure that equality and equity of access to you know societal resources and um, government institutions, you know, education, all all that goes into that. Coming up with a solution for that, I think, is community conversation, building empathy for others. And that's what libraries are about, which is one reason I see, see think libraries are under attack right now. You know, I think we need to, as a society, decide what's important to us. And it shouldn't be power over others, but the ability for everyone to come together and flourish 
in their own unique and individual ways and to cherish the ability to do that with the understanding that, you know, that protects my right to make my own choices, to flourish in my own way. And we shouldn't begrudge anyone that opportunity and that we should make sure that our government, our society is ordered around that idea that everyone should find the ability to flourish in the way that they choose. You know, the imagination, I mean, you know, you talked about all these essential rights and it's a, it's a, it's a, a gathering place, it's a social space for people to express themselves. But there's also the imagination and, you know, for young people and finding books or, you know, ideas that can make them think better, you know, think bigger about their lives. There's a paradox because the people that don't want that, how do we explain, I mean, what is the conversation around it hurts everyone? You just said a very important thing. The people that are maybe banning or, you know, against sort of freedom of thought or thinking are the ones that want to have their own idea. So it's, it's an inherent, com, you know, contradiction. How do we communicate that story? Because that's an important piece so that down the road, 20 years from now, we are in a very dead, closed society is what we're really talking about, where the folks that are, you know, perhaps against free thinking will also be hurt. And that's the part I don't know. How do we communicate that part of the story? It feels like. Yeah, I. You know, it's something that we're grappling with as well. And we try to elevate the idea that libraries are there for everyone to floor, you know, to find what they need, that we tolerate the idea that there might be a book I disagree with on the shelf because the library is going to be there to find the books I want and need. And whatever that means for individual or their family. You know, how to change hearts and minds has always been an open question and uh, a question of advocacy, a question of political and social will that I don't want to even pretend I have all the answers for. I have to confess, you know, my circle of concern, as they say, is this narrow one of protecting the ability of libraries and librarians to serve the information needs of their community and to protect the right of library users everywhere to make their own choices and to point out where that fits into the democratic enterprise that is represented by the United States of America. And, you know, finding new advocacy tools, uh, finding new ways of telling the story is always something we're looking to do. I think that uh, part of it is Maybe, uh, you know, one solution, I think, is civic education at the K through 12 level that really celebrates the democratic enterprise, especially those parts of it that are intended to protect those without power, those in the minority. I think that was taken out in the 70s, right? That was uh, somebody had a great idea that we would take civics out of daily yeah, education. Exactly. And then we're taking the history books out, too. So how do we, yeah. you know? Yeah. And- and that, that's where individuals at the local level can make a difference, insisting that the school board have civics education in place, government education in place, insisting that, that your, your student have access to history uh, materials and resources that don't just reflect one narrow orthodox viewpoint as well. Uh, my own story is that um, I grew up in a relatively prosperous working class suburb of Cleveland. I was the last class that had a year of civics education um, in my community, in my school system. Everyone who came after us was divided into little quarter long classes on particular topics, but they never got the complete overview of how laws are made and how Congress works and how our state government works. And I think that we're seeing the fruits of that loss of that kind of unified education around what democracy is meant to be and what how government works and how the rule of law is supposed to operate in this country, especially the purpose of doing justice and protecting those without power. You know, so you know, I know that Sandra Day O'Connor made it her life's work before she had to retire from the public stage to promote civics education. She left behind an organization that's still doing that work for civics education. And I think that's something that we can all get behind. You know, I can't see how anyone would object to that. I'm sure somebody would find it. As someone who's worked with a lot and a lot of censorship situations, I've seen a lot of it, but it might be one step to equipping 
particularly young people, with the knowledge, discernment, and information they need to bring back this idea of community and and tolerance that we're, we seem to be so lacking today. Are we heading into or in the middle of a Jim Crow era? I think certainly that it's the goal of some of the political advocacy groups we're seeing engaged in this conversation to do that. We have a number of, as I mentioned, there's a number of anti-LGBTQ groups that are intent on rolling back the same-sex marriage decision to put people back in the closet, to deny civil liberties to those who have different diverse gender identities or sexual orientation. And I do believe that they, there's a perception that expanding the conversation around the systemic racism that Black Americans have experienced in this country uh, is seen as a threat to the power and control of some political groups as well. By targeting books, both in public libraries and school libraries that illuminate the, the, these issues, I think it's a thought that, you know, out of sight, out of mind, or, you know, if we deny access to this information and conduct a campaign of indoctrination, we might actually, you know, we being these groups might be able to better control what people think and do and how they act in our society. You know, do you, do you see that also for women? Do you think they'd be happy if women were forced to wear burqas? <laughs> I, I wouldn't go, you know, I, I would say that we know that there are some political and religious movements that would severely limit the rights of women in regards to access to education, access to reproductive health, and that they are finding increasing traction in society and support from elected officials. It should be of concern to everyone that that's happening. I frankly wouldn't be where I am today without the liberty to pursue my education regardless of my gender, um, my sex, and the freedom that came with doing away with antiquated ideas that uh, a spouse had to control a woman's finances, for example, or that I couldn't make my own decisions about my bodily autonomy. And to allow a minority religious viewpoint to take control of everyone's lives. I, there are others who are far more eloquent on this point, but you know, shutting up half the population and taking away all their creativity, their thoughtfulness, their contributions to society simply because they were born a certain sex um, is certainly not the hallmarks of a democracy or uh, a flourishing society. You know, um, when I was a kid, the place I would live in the summers was very small and had a bookmobile would drive out to our, you know, literally out to our house and a few other houses in a row. You know, and so the library came to me, right, where I could pick books out and, you know, read the right. books for the week. And now, you know, routine, you know, we live on the West Coast and, you know, routinely I can access the libraries at Yale or at Oxford easily, you know, uh, or art projects that are going on around the globe. You know, what um, in your mind is the future of a library? You know, it's an outpost in a small town, but what does that outpost allow, you know, the individuals to be part of? Well, in theory, <laughs> with sufficient broadband access, you know, what you could access from a small town library should be unlimited. There are certainly constraints on that, not the least of which is broadband access. It's still an issue in many rural districts today that there's simply not good access to broadband. I have relatives who live in eastern Washington state, and they're still dependent on a satellite link, a very expensive satellite link for access to the internet. Tribal libraries find it very difficult to sustain a level of access to the internet that would allow access to platforms and sources of information, to ebooks, you know. But if we could resolve that broadband access issue, that last mile that we're still struggling with. 20 years later uh, in our country, we're finding authoritarian decisions to limit access to information, to require the filtering of research databases, to require the filtering of the internet itself, 
to require books be eliminated from databases because of moral political objections to those books. We know of a community in Texas that because they objected to one book on the, the ebook platform that provided access to 17,000 books, they pulled the plug on the entire platform. And that's the other danger of digital access, how easy it is to flip the switch or to excise uh, materials without anyone noticing. But that's where library professionals come in. They are catalogers. They work with metadata. They are the ones who keep track. And I'll point out it's the archivists who are hurrying uh, a former president for documents that rightfully belong to the government and in the archives, the National Archives and things like that which is another reason to support librarians and library professional, the archivists in the community. One would hope that we could have this utopian ideal of a place where everyone can go and access electronically digital platforms that open magically open the door to a wealth of information and ideas. But I think that uh, between commercial interests and, and the desire to limit access to information because someone doesn't approve of it, that promise hasn't been realized, even though it, it is a glimmering oasis out there that some libraries have actually been able to make real. I think of Brooklyn Public Library and their choice to use their resources to make a national library card available to young people in communities where books have been removed from the library shelves. And that's all possible because of digital access, because of broadband access, because of the ability to use one cell phone to use access cellular networks and get access to information. You know, we've talked we talk to people all over the world about really, you know, these existential crises, right? And this being one of them, right? The threat to our democracy. But what we hear often is also still young people are, you know, resilient and intuitively understand that maybe their rights are being taken away. At least we hope so. Jesse and I have met and talked to people all over the world in places where it is dangerous to express yourself and people seem to find a way whether you know, they can make a song that might communicate to the rest of the constituents, like you get vote this person out. I mean, you think you think of all the cartoons, right, that that are showing what's really going on in a country where it might might be more repressive. So do you believe just to, to kind of go forward on what you were just saying, that that people will find a way though to to express themselves and also is the idea of what is native you know, the right to freedom, is that something that we're born with? Do we, do we feel what repression is? If you haven't been taught or you haven't had access to information which opens up your mind to thinking about what is democracy, do you think that's an internal, you know, kind of flame that one in will inevitably go towards? What, any thoughts around that? It's sort of not what you probably usually do, but I'd be curious to get your point of view. You know, I have always argued that the foundation for intellectual freedom in the library is fundamentally a respect for the dignity and autonomy of the individual. And I think every individual has that, no matter what their educational background or lack of it, that idea of self-determination, of choice, of um, having the tools to make one own decisions is always there and that will drive people toward information and to sharing ideas to stand against what restricts that freedom as well you know it's always possible to subject individuals to the kind of treatment that would extinguish that spark of freedom and desire for self determination but more often than not, people nurture it, and we see it all the time, whether it's secret reading clubs for young women in Afghanistan or, you know, the use of graffiti to communicate ideas that is beyond the understanding and ken of elected officials who aren't in on, on the language of resistance and things like that. And that's what we are, you know, that in the end, that's what we're here to try to fight to protect is the ability to exercise that self-determination, to believe as one wishes, and to provide the tools to allow people to make those choices and to improve their lives. You know, it's the foundation of all librarianship, all information professionals to do.
is to do that. So, you know, I think about that because often I'm told, well, you know, intellectual freedom, what does that mean? You know, and we always look to Article 19, Article 12, but in the end, it means that intellectual freedom is all about the individual and respecting who they are and the choices they make and making it possible for them to make those choices. Fantastic. Really appreciate your time, Deborah, and thank you for sharing your point of view. Tremendous conversation. Really appreciate it. Well, well, thank you for inviting me. It's been a privilege to have this time with you. Thank you. And also just one more time, tell us the people were going to, I know they're going to ask us, well, what, what should we do? They want to ask you. So if you could just say like the the website that you cited earlier, just as, as one idea of where they can go. You know, there's really two places to go. One is the one intended for individuals in the community. It's called Unite Against Book Bans, uniteagainstbookbans.org, all one word. And it's intended to provide resources for those who want to engage at the local level to fight the advocacy against access to information, to fight censorship in their schools and libraries. But there's also a page at the ALA.org, American Library Association, of course, um, ALA.org website called Fight Censorship. And it collects a wealth of tools that are both intended for the public, but also for library professionals to use in challenging demands for censorship. And one of the most important tools I would recommend is we ask both library professionals, education professionals, but also members of the community to report incidents of censorship so we can track these trends to identify need and to develop resources and tools to address new and emerging efforts to censor access to information. And I recommend both resources to you uh, as you uh, think about how to move forward. Bam Books Week Coalition as well. Um, brings together a number of national partners, not just librarians, but booksellers, educators, publishers, um, authors, who all are devoted to the idea that um, everyone should have the freedom to read and write and speak and and to protect those freedoms. Thank you, Deborah. Be well, stay safe. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, you guys.